Okay, hey guys, hope all is well. So we're continuing Indisputable Truth. We uh, covered a lot of topics um, from from the beginning. Basically, we talked about you know uh, the you know the introduction. We we said the the ideas we need to consider before beginning. We talked about the proving God. But then we talked about the idea of of, of that how God has to he's still involved with the world. And then we talked about the idea that if the God created the world. He didn't just create the world and, and leave. It must be that he's still involved with it, and then he must. There must be a purpose, and then he must have communicated to mankind that purpose. And that's what we say. Religion comes in. Then we go into the idea of which religion is from God. So before go, proving which religion is from God, we we were going through the ideas how we know religion is not from God. So for example, we talked about Christianity and Islam, and we went through th those books which claim to be a part two of the Old Testament, which is the Torah, the Jewish Torah, the Jewish Bible. And how we showed it, how in all these religions, there's basically, we said the idea that if there's mistakes in a book and someone's claiming that book's from God, it can't be from God. If God's, if someone's coming through a book and they say, God, give me this book, and the book says the Eiffel Tower is in Los Angeles or it's in New York, right? You're not going to be like, you're going to be like, what the heck are you talking about? You know, the, uh, the books can be from God. God would never make such a mistake. So mistakes like that, you would find all over the, the, New Te the Christian, the Christian uh, Bible, the New Testament, and you'd find in the Quran. And we went through all that. And then we talked about Buddhism, because we know there's a lot of Jews who follow Buddhism. And we showed how Buddhism has literally no logic, no evidence, not even a belief system. It totally has nothing to do with anything. There's no like claim to truth. They just claim there's a, a nice teachings, like a Tony Robbins class. You know, Tony Robbins gave a nice class. They call him, they call him the Buddha. He gave some nice classes on how to live a, a meaningful and peaceful life. Chazak Baruch, and that's it, you know? That's it. There's no claim to truth. No, God gave this. God gave that. No, like, so uh, we said, we said the idea that, okay, if a religion claims they have something from God, we'll look into them. You know, that's why Christianity is on. We looked into them, you know, but if a religion claims that they don't, if they don't claim anything, they don't claim God gave them anything, then I don't care what your grandfather, uh, you know, came up with, or some like guy from a thousand years ago came up with a man written religion, you know, nice, like good for you. You know, it's, is it nice teaching? Is it beautiful teaching? Yes, we see that all the time. But that doesn't mean that your religion is the truth of, you, of the universe, and that's what we have to follow. And that's why we, we, we canceled out Buddhism because of that. And, uh, and then we said, basically, just a general rule for all religions and cults, because obviously there's not enough time to investigate everything. But we just basically said the rule that if we prove Judaism is from God, we automatically disprove every other religion and cult, because... Judaism, by definition, is, is if uh, the one of the, the belief of Judaism is that Judaism, uh, there's no other religion. Judaism is the only religion, right? And God didn't give a part two, or part three, or part four, or whatever it is, right? There's no new prophet. So all these religions that contradict Judaism, by proving Judaism is true, we automatically disprove them. So let's begin with Judaism. We're going to talk about the history of Judaism, and then we're going to go into uh, a prelude. Before we need to have like a little bit of background information before we can fully like you know understand. Uh, um, like, you know, the proofs and everything of how you know Judaism is from God. Okay, so I'm reading. Uh, uh, okay, you guys got the section? Okay, good. So Judaism. I'm going to read it inside and then summarize it. Judea the Jewish nation began when Abraham, Abraham, who lived around 1800 BCE, came to the conclusion that there must be a God by using simple logic and common sense. So you remember when I told you the proofs of the first cause argument, intelligent design argument? So when I told you the proof, I was telling you, I was telling you the proof with, like, you know, a bunch of scientific information that we found out nowadays and whatever. Avraham, Abraham, came to that conclusion because obviously you could, the first cause of your argument, intelligent eye, is also logical arguments. Even if you didn't have all the scientific evidence, you know, backing it up or whatever, but it's a, it's a log, there are logical arguments. He used those arguments to come to the idea that there's a God. So, so throughout Abraham's life, God tested him several times, and the successful conclusion of his test demonstrated Abraham's, Abraham's devotion to the truth and loyalty to God. As a result, God made a covenant with Abraham that his descendants will be a holy nation. Meaning, the whole world was going against God. Everyone's just doing whatever the heck they want, you know, and, you know, in idol worship, it, basically living the life of live free, do whatever you want, know God, do whatever, worship whatever God you want at the moment, right? Whatever, you know, the liberalism of the time, right? Every, every generation, there's, there's some kind of, you know, like, ism that people follow that basically lets them do whatever they want and not feel guilty about it, okay? And uh, back then it was paganism. And the idea was that Avraham, in a world, God didn't talk to him, nothing. He used common sense and logic. There must be a creator to the universe. It can't be this universe came by itself. It has to be a first cause. You know, if, if everything's finite, everything's physical, that had to come from that, and that had to come from something. And whatever the first thing that created everything can't be physical. It has to be infinite because then you're going to ask what created that. It's a very, lo it's a logical argument. You don't need 
be no science to prove that. It's, it's logic and math, and, and math, basically. But the idea is what? That he used that argument and he came to Google that must be a God. And he started going to the entire world and, and an entire world that's pagan, pagan. He started going and preaching to guys, there must be a God. And if there's a God, there must be a purpose to life. And he was preaching it and going around and debating people and talking to people and spreading the truth. And obviously, uh, people didn't like what, that he was doing that, you know. And that's why they call him Abraham Ha'ivri. The word Hebrew, in Hebrew we call it Ivri, means on the other side. Avram's on one side, the whole world's on, the, on, a, on another side, right? And what happened, people didn't like what he was doing. And because of that, people got, he made some enemies. You know, when you're, like, you know, for example, like Hitler. Hitler saw the Jews were spreading morality in the world. And he wrote in his book, Mein Kampf, that, like, I don't, these people are enemies. They're the enemies of of society. They're not going to let us live lives of, you know, paganism and barbarism where you can live free and do whatever you want. And he was threatened by that. So same thing. There's a guy at the time, his name was Nimrod, and he was threatened. He was threatened that Avram was coming in and preaching the truth and whatever. And that's what the whole story where we know from the oral Torah that Ab it says Avram's from ur -Kastim. We ask the question, what does that mean, ur -Kastim? That Ur means fire, right? The city of fire. Like, what does that mean? And we know from the oral Torah that the whole story that Avram got thrown in a, in a, they threw him in a furnace and there was a miracle where God saved him. They threw him in a furnace because they, you know, they, whatever, they got into a debate. Avram won the debate. They got, the king didn't like it. Nimrod and whatever. Long story. But the idea is what? That Avraham didn't just like, okay, people say, oh, the, Jew, the chosen people, it, it's, it's, it's racist. No, it's not racist. The chosen people doesn't mean, oh, I'm better than you. The chosen people means there's a responsibility and whoever steps up to the plate can take that responsibility. And Avram, in a world where no one's taking responsibility, said, I'm going to take responsibility. And God said, Abraham, you take responsibility and to you know spread the light, pass it down to your descendants of the truth of the universe, the purpose of life. I'm choosing you and your descendants to be the chosen people, meaning what? The people are going to spread morality and bring the whole world to God. That's what um, that's what Avram's task was. And now, why is it not racist? Because we don't say, oh, you're white, I'm black. We don't say any of that. We say whoever wants to join the club could join. It doesn't matter your, your skin color, it doesn't matter. As long as you agree to the rules of the club, you could join the club. So if you want to become a Jew and you say, okay, I'm going to do the whole conversion process. I'm going to study, you know, the, 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 the written Torah, the oral Torah. I'm going to, you know, read the indisputable truth. I'm going to get the basic foundations. And then you accept upon yourself to keep all the commandments and you study them and you go through the whole conversion process, you know, doing an Orthodox conversion. Obviously any other conversion beside Orthodox is not good because as we said before, for example, reform and, 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 and conservative, they don't abide by the rules of the Torah of what God gave to do it right conversion. They don't do it how God told Moses. So we obviously can't rely on that. And the Orthodox are the only people who do it in the way that God told Moses, whatever, long story with that. But the idea is what? That we say that if you want to be a Jew, you want to, you, you could do it. You just have to take on the responsibility. You have to keep the rules of the club. You have to keep the Torah. You have to keep Shabbat, keep the mitzvah, whatever. So that's why it's not racist. That's why chosen people, if anyone asks you, oh, chosen people, it's racist. No, explain to them. It's a responsibility. And anybody, even the non-Jew the non who lives in Zimbabwe, if he wants to be Jewish and he takes it upon himself, he could do it. But he obviously has to do it in, in the correct manner, right? And obviously ask your or local Orthodox rabbi of the whole process. Okay, fine. So that's why Avraham was chosen, because he went against the whole world and he taught the world about God, even though everyone was against him. And God said, I would choose you. Okay, fine. And your descendants. So upon, uh, okay, up until the revelation at Mount Sinai, and the revelation at Mount Sinai is basically where God spoke to the entire Jewish nation to millions of people in a public event. Again, every religion started with one person. Judaism is the only religion where God spoke to everybody in a public, where God spoke to the entire nation in a public event. It's not like, oh, one person saying God spoke to me, you know? Millions of people. It's very hard to, you know, make, make up such a claim. So that happened at Mount Sinai when the Jews left Egypt. The Jews were basically, they were known as the Hebrews or the Israelites. Once the Hebrews received the Torah, and by, uh, yeah, once the Hebrews received the Torah, they, offici they officially became the nation of Israel. Am Yisrael. Am means nation of Israel. The chosen nation, okay? The Israelites were slaves to the Egyptians for 210 years before the giving of the Torah on, at 1313 BCE. Toward the end of this period, Moses was chosen by God. So they were slaves for 210 years. And then God came to Moses. Uh, Moses, uh, God, God chose Moses to be the leader of the Jews. The Israel, let's call them Israelites because they're not Jews then. And then we, uh, before then, and then we say, uh, who, uh, so Moses was chosen by God to be the leader of the Israelites. 
who would take them out of Egypt. The Jews, okay, now the Jews claim to be uh, to have received a Torah approximately 3,300 years ago on Mount Sinai, which is around 49 days after the exodus of Egypt. They claim that the whole nation, which consisted of 3 million people, heard the first two commandments of the Ten Commandments from God himself. As the verse says, um, this is a quote from Exodus uh, chapter 19, verse 18, Mount Sinai was all in smoke, for God had come up, down upon it. And obviously, we don't. God is not physical, we don't believe that. We, it's obviously speaking in a metaphorical fashion that they saw that, like, you know, in a sense, the presence of God, whatever that means, a lot more details for that for another time. In addition, but we obviously don't believe he's physical. That's against the Torah to believe God's physical. In addition, the whole nation witnessed God and Moses having a conversation. As the verse says in Exodus uh, chapter, 19, verse 9, uh, chapter 19, verse 19, Moses uh, says Moses would speak and God answered him with a voice. Meaning, it's not like, oh, one, hey, God spoke to me. Oh, God said this. No, everybody saw God and Moses speaking. Everyone heard the conversation. Okay. Furthermore, when God was about to recite the third commandment of the Ten Commandments, the Jews were frightened by the greatness. And by the way, this was this past week's Parsha of the Ten Commandments. Uh, the Jews were very frightened by the greatness of the event and couldn't physically tolerate the revelation. So they told Moses to go up to the mountain and speak to God. And whatever God says, they will do. As the verse says in Exodus chapter 20, verse 16, you shall, uh, uh, they, the Jews, said to Moses, you speak to us and we will hear, but, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Meaning it was so intense to speak to God. Imagine the creative universe speaking to you. It's probably like, you know, a life-changing a, a moment, a event, and they couldn't handle it. They heard the two of the Ten Commandments, and they said, God, Moses, we know you're legit. This is too much for us. Because we know you're legit, we trust you now because God put a stamp of approval for you to go up and, you know, and, and, uh, Bring down the rest of the Torah. We don't. We don't need God to tell us the whole Torah. You you go up because we know you're legit now. Because God proved it to everybody, okay? But don't let God speak to us because it's too much for us. Again, they heard God, but then it got too much. Eventually, Moses compi uh, complied with the nation's wishes and told them the remainder of the commandments. Okay, Moses went then went up to Mount Sinai for forty days and forty nights to receive the Torah, both the oral Torah and some of the written Torah. Okay, now the written Torah, um, it's only from Genesis to Yitro, to Jetro, so only certain parshas. The rest of the five books of Moshe were finished on the day of Moshe's death, okay? So when Moshe went out for 40 days and 40 nights, he didn't receive like all the events after Parsha Yitro. That happened throughout the 40 years and God told him to write it down throughout the process. But I'll, I'll explain to you the written Torah, what the written Torah is um, and what the oral Torah is. So the oral Torah is basically the explanation and commandments and teachings which are given to, together with the written Torah, the Jewish Bible. And I'll explain more when we get to that section. Okay, so the Tanakh. So the written Torah, so we call it the Jewish Bible, the, the Tanakh in Hebrew. Tanakh stands for Torah, right? Five books of Moses. Nevi'im is the prophets, right? Like Isaiah, Joshua, whatever. And Ketuvim, which is scriptures. Okay, and I'll explain each category. Um... When we say the Bible, it can mean the five books of Moses or it can mean the entire written Torah, which includes the prophets and scriptures. So let me ex quickly name all the books of the written Torah of the, of, the, of the Jewish Bible. So the Torah is consists of Genesis, which is Bereshit in Hebrew, Exodus, which is Shemot in Hebrew, Leviticus, Vayikra, Numbers, Bamidbar, and Deuteronomy, right, Devarim. Now that's the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, whatever in the Hebrew you could see yourself. And then the prophets, um, uh, are the Nevi'im, which we say in Hebrew. That's what the prophets mean in Hebrew. And we say all the prophets. So after Moses dies, Joshua. And after Joshua was the judges, right? And after the judges was Samuel, Shmuel. Okay, we say in Hebrew. And then after that was the book of Kings, which is King David, King Solomon, and Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, jo Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Malachi was the last prophet, Okay. All of, by the way, this re, these are all books that I'm listing of all the prophets. Okay, and then scriptures is Kituvim, Kituvim or like Psalms, which is Tehillim, Proverbs, I think is Mishle, uh, Eov, which is Job, the book of Job, Song of Songs, Shira Shirim, Ruth, the book of Ruth, we read on Shavuot, Lamentations is Echa, we just read that on Tisha B'Av, Istakhalis, uh, I think is uh, uh, Kohelet, Esther, Megillah Esther, we read on Purim, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and then Chronicles is Debra Hayamim. So basically, these books are Ketuvim, which is basically, so the prophets, you had all the prophets. So let's say in the book of Samuel, you had King David. Now, some of the prophets wrote extra books, obviously with divine, like uh, they're were, they were divine, meaning God told them what to write. But for example, King David wrote Psalms. 
you know, Proverbs, Lamentations, Isaacles, whatever was written by, uh, you know, King Solomon and Ki King Solomon, King Christia. Book of Esther is written by Esther, right? So these are also like a part of our, our written Torah. Okay, fine. So that's the written Torah. Okay, now we said when Mo Moses went up, what time is it? Six minutes? Okay. We said that when Moses went up, what was he doing for 40 days and four night, 40 nights? What was he doing? Just chilling, eating, right? Writing the Ten Commandments. Everyone thinks, oh yeah, it took him 40 nights for, to bring down the Ten Commandments. No. Moses is there for 40 days and four nights because we say that he, he, his, his neshama left his body, his soul left his body, and God basically downloaded the entire written Torah. Again, not, not up from the book of Jethro because all those events didn't happen, but basically he gave them the entire Torah, meaning, but more specifically, the oral Torah. Now, what is the oral Torah? The oral Torah, which we call in Hebrew the Torah Sheba'al Peh. What is oral Torah? The Torah Sheba'al Peh, also known as the oral law. The oral Torah is the explanation and instructions on how to observe the 613 commandments, which God taught to Moses. Um, okay, I was just looking at the footnote. Um, Jews believe that the Torah, both the oral and written, originated in heaven and is entirely from God. Moses did, not write what, Moses did not write what he wanted. Rather, he was only a scribe receiving dictation from God. The oral law, on the other hand, was verbally passed down from generation to generation until at risk of being lost under the Roman persecution. It was eventually written down as the Mishnah and Talmud. And we say Talmud, we call it Gemara in Hebrew. Today, we have uh, written codes of law, such as the Shulchan Aruch, that are based on the early commentaries on the Mishnah and Talmud. Jews believe that these books are God's words and will. Okay. Now, before we give evidence in regards to the writ, uh, in, uh, to the Torah, the written and oral Torah being okay. Before I let's let's explain the oral Torah a little bit. So imagine this: you have the Torah, right? The Torah gives you commandments. We call them mitzvot, right? And there's six thirteen of them. Now, the Torah is the the written Torah is a very very cryptic book. It's not clear. It doesn't tell you. For example, it says on Shabbat, it says keep Shabbat, right? Right? What is what's Shabbat? It doesn't define to you what Shabbat is. Right? The seventh day you shall rest. Don't do malacha. By the way, malacha doesn't mean rest. It means acts of creation. What's malacha? What's malacha? Right? It says, where's tzitzit? What's tzitzit? It says, put on tefillin, totafot. What's tefillin? What's, what's totafot? I don't know what that is. Right? We know that's tefillin. It says, put a mezuzah on your wall. What's a mezuzah? Right? I never seen it. It says, get a beautiful fruit tree. What is that? Right? It, the written Torah doesn't explain to you the commandments. It doesn't explain to you what a Jew should believe. It's a very, very cryptic book. So Jews believe, and every Jew believed this from history until the Reform and Conservative came and skewed it and whatever and started saying their own stuff. But every Jew always believed that the written Torah, right, is never just the written Torah. God gave the written and oral Torah. The oral Torah is, a, is the explanation of the written Torah. I'll give you a beautiful example. I think where Yisrael Salanter gives this example. It's a big rabbi. For example, let's say you're in a, a chemistry class, okay? And your, professor, uh, and your professor is, you know, speaking and you're taking notes. Now, when you take notes in your chemistry class or your bio class, you're not writing every single letter and every single word. It's impossible. You're speaking thousands of words, you know, per, per minute, whatever, hundreds of words per minute. So you're writing summaries of what he's saying. You're listening, you're summarizing, listening, summarizing. Now, if I came and I saw your notes, would I be like, oh, I know exactly what's going on? No, it's very hard for me to understand if I didn't hear the one hour explanation of what the notes were saying. So too, the written and oral Torah. The oral, the oral Torah is the one-hour lecture, and the written Torah are the notes. The written Torah is a super summary of the oral Torah. So if you read the written Torah, it's like a super cryptic form, and the only way to unlock it is if you listen to that one-hour lecture, quote-unquote, which means the oral Torah. If you listen, if you, and that's why, so Moses, so God told Moses how to keep Shabbat, how to keep kosher, how to, you know, not, the laws of wool and linen, the laws of holidays, the laws of every single thing you could think of, of Jews, even the beliefs, what are we supposed to believe in? The belief that God doesn't have a body, the belief in the idea that the Torah will never change, all these ideas, God taught to Moses, okay? Now you can find hints of them and, and, and passages of these topics in the written Torah, but the main place to really find everything is the oral Torah. And now that was passed down from generation to generation, right? From Moses, Moses gave it to, again, the Jewish people said, Moses, you go to Mount Zion, you go to, to heaven, you get the, bring the entire Torah, the oral Torah, and then you teach it to us because you know you're legit. And then throughout the 40 years the Jews are in the desert, Moses was teaching the Jews the entire oral Torah, the entire Jewish people. They had a whole process of how they taught it. If you want to look at the process, go to Gemara, Talmud, Babylonian, Babylonian Talmud, Eruvin 54b. and explains the whole process. And the idea is what? That 
Moses taught to the entire Jewish people, and now the Jewish people for generations, rabbi to student, father to son, was passing it down. And they all lived in Israel, and it was very, very easy to pass down generation to generation. But what happened is that the Romans came, and the Babylonians, the Romans, and enemies came, and they started persecuting the Jews, and they started scattering the Jews. Now, we can't pass down the Torah orally. We can't learn in peace. We're getting scattered. So came the, all the Jewish people of the generation, particularly the rabbis, the sages, the, 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 and they said, listen, if we don't write the oral Torah down, we will lose it forever because you're going to have one Jew in, we're going to have one Jew in Rome and one Jew in, uh, one Jew in you know, uh, Iran. And they're not going to, they're going to, they're, they're not going to know. They're not going to be on the same page. And that's what the Mishnah came. The Mishnah was basically a super cryptic version of the entire six, uh, you know, like all the, basically the entire oral Torah written in a very precise and distinct manner. And I'm almost done. And that now over time, that got too cryptic. The Mishnah, we, the Jews, they, they wrote it in a way that you have to learn it with a rabbi. It's not impo- and you can't learn the Mishnah by yourself unless you're learning it with somebody who's going to explain it to you. That's what they wrote it in a way, so because they want to keep it in a way that it's passed down, you know, from rabbi to son, father to student, all the way to Moses. They don't want to make it like, oh, you just read a textbook because black and white text is always subject to interpretation, right? So came the Mishnah, and then that was too much. That was too cryptic. So then came the Gemara. The Gemara came and expanded the mission and explained that. But then that was even too much. So then you needed something called the, the Rishonim. The, you needed like rabbis like Rashi and whatever to explain to you what the Gemara was saying. And then you have the Rishonim. And then even their words were a little bit too cryptic. Then you, they came the Achronim. The Achronim are the later rabbis. And each generation, the rabbis, the, the leaders of the generation. Again, I'm not talking about a rabbi. When I say rabbi, I'm not talking about a rabbi. I'm talking about the, the, the sages, the leaders of the Jewish people, right? The teachers of all the Jewish people. That's what a rabbi means. And they taught... The Jews, uh, they, they were basically explaining the oral Torah and passing it down with the entire Jewish people together. So it was not just one person doing it, it was all the Jewish people. But they were basically like expanding the Mishnah, the Gemara, and writing more. And eventually the Mishnah and Gemara, right, obviously there was a lot of books in between, but turned into the Mishnah Torah, which the Rambam wrote, which codified because all the laws of, of, the, of the Talmud, of how to keep Shiva and Kosher, were all scattered. And it was very hard for an average Jew to just pick up the Talmud and know what's going on. So came the Rambam, he wrote the Mishnah Torah, he categorized, okay, all the laws of Shabbat, Kosher, whatever. Instead of being scattered, he organized them and wrote in a book. And then even now was too much. Then came the, the Shulchan Aruch, and the Shulchan Aruch, basically, the Jewish code of law, he came and he basically wrote, Rambam talked about even topics that don't apply today, right? Like Bet HaMikdash or whatever, which we can't do because we don't have one. And the Shulchan Aruch just wrote about the... He basically like took the Rambam, took two other big rabbis, and summarized all the halachic rulings of what to do. And uh, that's the Shulchan Aruch. And then whatever, slowly, slowly, there came more books after that. But again, these are all God's words. These are all Hashem passing it down. And again, it's not like, oh, rabbi saying, okay, let me write whatever I want, whatever I feel like. Okay, fine. So next section, we're going to end off here. Now, before we give evidence in regards to the Torah, the written oral Torah being from God, let's discuss first how we know with certainty that the Jews received the oral law along with the written law. Basically, the next section we're going to do is we're going to prove how we know there's an oral law. I gave some proofs before, but we'll end here. Chazak Baruch.